Well, good morning, everyone. It is so glad to see you all here today. You are very intrepid for getting out on this morning. And also, good morning to all of you all who uh, probably wisely are watching us on Facebook. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of scripture. The first lesson today is also my absolute favorite Old Testament story. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and laid down. The Lord called again. Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. 
But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsively by half verse from Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. You press upon me behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your work is wonderful and I know it My body was not hidden from you. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it, for it is said, the two shall be one flesh. 
But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was, uh, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Jesus in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth, Nathanael said to him, can anything, good come, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, he said, out, he said to him, of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, again, good morning, intrepid people of God. So, uh, I, I looked at the weather. I've been looking at the weather every day. Uh, my spouse has been telling me that's not helpful because it doesn't actually change the weather if you check it multiple times a day. Uh, but today is the coldest of the days this week, so it only gets better from here. So there you go. Uh, somebody told me in seminary that every sermon has to contain hope. So there you go. It warms up from here. Well, the question that came up for me when I was reading through the, the uh, scriptures that we have today um, was questions that related to holiness. So holiness. How do we know when something is holy? How do we know when we have been made holy? I think the readings today ask us to sort of consider those questions, or at least they invite us to ask those questions. And to get the answer to that, like so many things, it may depend on who you ask. Who you ask the question, how do we know what's holy? How do we know when we are made holy? Now, last Wednesday, during our book study, we're studying a book called Holy Imagination by a professor at the seminary I attended, Judy Fentress-Williams. 
And part of what we talked about last Wednesday was the book of Leviticus. It is the third book of the Bible. Uh, comes after Genesis and Exodus. Uh, and that book, the book of Leviticus, is, is uh, almost completely about nothing but holiness. What makes something holy? So it's all about holiness. And in that book, in the book of, Le- of Leviticus, holiness is established through particular customs and rituals. So you can make something holy or you can draw attention to the holiness of something through customs and rituals. And these rituals also have a way of establishing community norms so that folks know right up front what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, what is clean and what is unclean, you might say. Now, the holiness code in Leviticus addresses issues like what foods are acceptable to eat or how to treat mold or skin conditions of various kinds. How to conduct animal sacrifices is also contained in the book of Leviticus. Now, the challenge, of course, is that if Leviticus is teaching us about holiness, it contains a bunch of practices that none of us do anymore, right? No one, for the most part, that I know of at least, is bringing in animals to church and saying, now, where are the rules on how we sacrifice this sucker? Like, how do we do that, right? So we abandoned all that stuff hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We don't do that anymore. So, the question that we then ask is, if it is true that over time we change the rules about what makes something holy and what makes something not holy or what makes something clean and what makes something unclean, if that is true, then what are the standards that we are using today? Like, how do we decide today? If we can't go back to some of these ancient texts and use those rules, then how do we decide as a community what rules to use? And I think we get a clue on how to do that from 1 Corinthians. I think 1 Corinthians gives us a way of us to start thinking about this question of how do we want to think about what makes something holy and what makes something not so. Now, what we heard from Paul today were things like food and our stomachs aren't as important as other things, right? So food is made for the stomach and the stomach is made for food, but those are all temporary they're passing, they're under God's power anyway. So whether what we're eating and what we're not eating, that's probably not important, right? That's probably not the thing that's going to tell us what's holy and not holy. But a disproportionate love for food, clinging to a love for food, making a love for food central to our lives above all else, now that, that might be something to think about. That might be something that is starting to tell us what makes something holy or not holy. Now, the term that we got in our reading today that Paul was asking us to avoid is fornication. And that obviously has a very specific meaning for us when you translate from the Greek to the English. But the Greek word that we translated like that is really broader. And it's a catch-all for anything we care about more than we care about our allegiance to God. So anything that we prioritize above God, anything that we prioritize as more important than our relationship to God, that is what gets translated as fornication in our reading. So for Paul, Paul wants to remind us that God is the only thing, the one thing and the only thing that is the Lord over our lives. And our allegiance, our belonging to God is something that should be complete. And for Paul, he also thinks of us, he doesn't separate stuff out like he doesn't have mind over here and spirit over here and body here. For Paul, mind, body, and spirit are all integrated. We're we're one integrated being and all those things come bundled together. So how we treat our body is just another way of saying how we honor God, right? So how we honor God is, is something that is disclosed in how we treat our physical beings, So, for Paul, the body becomes a temple, and maintaining the body as best we can is an act of holiness, because it brings honor to our Lord God. This also provides a check on social status, as no one's body is any more or less holy than someone else's body. So, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter what kind of status you have in society— 
Those things can't be used as a baseline for comparison between people. Our service to the Lord is what matters. Our service to the Lord is the only thing that matters as far as Paul is concerned. And so 1 Corinthians gives us Paul's take on what makes us holy. So what makes us holy? Is it what you eat? Is it how you treated a skin condition? Is it how you got rid of mold? Is that how, what makes you holy? No. No, for Paul, it's the way that we serve the Lord God. And just as with Leviticus, it's up to us to determine how this applies in our culture. Now again, it helps to remember that both Leviticus and Paul are starting from the conviction that we belong first and foremost to the Lord. And loyal service to the Lord is how we are sanctified and made holy. So I'm going to use a quote here. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's similar to what Mr. Spock says to James Kirk in the movie The Wrath of Khan. Yes, I figured out a way to work in The Wrath of Khan. So Spock says to Kirk, commanding a starship is your first best destiny. Anything else is a waste of material. So we might paraphrase that by saying serving the Lord is our first best destiny and anything else is a waste of material. But of course, we're not going to be able to serve God perfectly all of the time. We know that. So we're not always going to be able to honor the temple of the Lord the way that God deserves. And we get a reading, and I actually love that we got a shout out as this was my, so we heard our Old Testament reader today say that our reading today from the Old Testament was her favorite reading ever, which I think is, it's it's an awesome reading. It's great that that that's her favorite. Um, And it kind of gives us another example of what it's like to have this relationship with the temple that could be better. So, Eli is the chief priest of the temple, and his eyesight is failing. You might remember that from the reading. His eyesight is growing dim. And that's a metaphor for his failing ability to be able to honor and serve God, or to even know what God wants from him anymore. So, his ability to serve has been fading as well. You know, as I mentioned, Eli is the high priest of the temple, so it's a position of great importance for his community. And his inability to serve the way that God deserves to be served in that capacity is definitely a problem. So God calls to Samuel. Samuel's a kid. He's maybe 10 or 11 years old, and he's living at the temple. He's learning to serve at the temple. And God calls to Samuel, and that signals that there's going to be a changing of the guard. Samuel is going to be taking over for Eli. He's going to replace him as a messenger and as someone who can appropriately serve God in the temple. But what God wants from Samuel isn't clear at first. God calls three times to Samuel, but he misunderstood. He gets confused. He thinks Eli is calling him. And Eli himself also misunderstood. Even though he's a priest at the temple and has been a priest for decades, he also misunderstands what's going on until the third calling. And then finally, Eli understands And he's able to tell Samuel how to respond. And in responding to God, Samuel is in fact honoring what God is asking of him. But when Samuel does this, when he receives God's message, instead of making him happy, it actually fills him with dread because he receives a message that he is supposed to pass along to Eli. And it's not, it's a grim message. It's not a happy message at all. So Samuel, after having received his call from God, lays awake for the rest of the night, wondering what he should do. And he wakes up not wanting to do the thing that he knows he has to do. But that next morning, Eli makes it easy on Samuel. He actually demands that Samuel tell him what God shared with him the night before. And by doing that, it frees up Samuel to honor God and to do the work that he's been called to do basically gives him permission to be the prophet that God is calling him to be. And so in this way, even though he's failed in so many ways, Eli kind of comes back to himself. He begins to honor God again. He's able to let go of his attachment to being this 
this priest at the center of the, the action. You know, he accepts the fact that there's now a new prophet, even though it now puts him out of a job. He even accepts the fact that he's going to be held accountable for the mismanagement of the temple under his watch. The truth is, is he'd been presiding over a temple full of corruption. He stood by while his own sons were the ones who were committing acts that violated their duties as temple priests. And he's told by Samuel, Samuel receives a message from God, and he's told by Samuel that he will be held accountable for this. Now, Eli, after hearing the message, could have argued about it. He could have denied it. He could have told Samuel he was a big old liar or maybe just misunderstood, but he doesn't do any of those things. What Eli says is simply, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So in the end, Eli manages to remain faithful to God and he helps restore the temple. He helps, making it, he helps to make it holy again by giving it back to its good use and allowing Samuel to be the priest that that temple deserved and to be the prophet that the people deserved. Now, Eli's, may, his case may have been an extreme one, but all of us will probably have a moment, maybe more than one moment, in which we see that our lives have ceased to be temples of holiness. Something has gotten in the way. We'll discover that maybe we have devoted our lives to something else and we put something else above our relationship with God. And so Eli and Paul remind us that holiness comes from a return to faithfulness. It comes from loyalty and service. And it comes from loyalty and service to God. And when we put something else above those things, we can return to God and thus make our temples holy once again. So it's a reminder of who our temples serve and how we become temples ourselves. Another reminder of this might be a little prayer. It's called the Shema. We also studied this last Wednesday in our book study. But this little prayer sort of encapsulates, I think, this idea. It's very short. And the prayer goes, listen, our God is the Lord, only the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, and with all your strength. That's it. That's the entire prayer. But as I mentioned, it kind of says it all. Especially about what we can do to make ourselves a temple and to keep it holy. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People Bound together in Christ in the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us pray with one heart and mind to God our Father. 
We pray for peace from things that separate us from one another and for our salvation. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the holy churches of God, especially St. Mary's Edmund, St. Mary's School Edmund, the Diocese of New Jersey, the Diocese of New York, the Diocese of Newark, and the Anglican Church of Canada. We pray for this holy gathering and those who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God. Lord, have mercy. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Paulson, our bishop, Chris and Tom, our clergy, Alex and Audrey, our wardens, vestry, delegates, all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God, Lord, have mercy. We pray for the world and its leaders, our nation and its people. We pray for our leaders especially, Joe, our president, Kamala, our vice president, Josh, our congressman, James and Mark Wayne, our senators, Kevin, our governor, and Marlon, our mayor. Lord, have mercy. We pray for prisoners, for the oppressed, and all those in need or suffering, especially the Johnson family, Ronnie, Mike, John, Geneva, Glenn, Rose, Karen, Paul, Tracy, Adriana, Fred, Stuart, John Paul, Michael, Joey, Nancy, Dale, Gary, Brittany, Thomas, Catherine, Jennifer, Patricia, Kathy, Dustin, Paula, Philip, Marlene, Taylor, Richard, Case, Alyssa, those impacted by war and violence, all emergency responders, United States military, and those whose suffering is known only to God. And we pray for those who have died. Lord, have mercy. We pray for ourselves, our families, and those we love. And we pray for those in our parish especially, Jane, Betty, Tom, and Jean. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another in the name of the Lord.
Burr. <laughs> the uh, scouts came back early. They, they left yesterday uh, about, about 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. They loaded up and they came home. They, it was just miserable cold and, and not pleasant. <laughs> so they're, they came home. And as far as I know, everybody got back all safe and well, and there were no outfalls from it. Uh, it's warm in the parish hall after service. Come over, have a cup of coffee, and then go home <laughs> and stay warm. Good morning. Well, there's only two things I ever talk about. So first I'm going to talk about EFM. We're starting our new year uh, the first Sunday in February. And I've sent out an email to people who indicated they wanted to be part of our group. If you did not get an email from me, let me know. Either I typed your, your address in wrong or I didn't have it or something. So just let me know. Second thing is the kids program. We have the children's program, Godly Play. Um, we start at 1015 on Sunday, but we don't actually start our lesson then. That, gives parents and grandparents a chance to deposit their children with us and then come over to the church. So if you're running a little late, don't worry about it. Just drop your, your children off and they will. There's always a lesson and we do some art crafty things and then we have a, our little feast for them. And then after the lesson, it, it ends, godly play ends right around the time that we're doing peace in here. And so some children want to come over for the second part of church and they come over and sit with their families and the kids that are just full of energy and need to get rid of some of it go to the nursery and play. So please remember to bring your children because we have a really good time. So I have uh, four very brief announcements. First announcement is uh, we will meet this Wednesday to continue our book study for Holy Imagination. Um, we'll be doing parts three and four, which is a much shorter reading than we had last week. So it's like half the reading we did for the first session. So if you'd like to engage with this book and engage with this group, we're having a really good time and enjoying it. And it's half the reading that we did last week. So there you go. You get to jump in and, uh, you know, like for half the cost. Um, Second announcement is two weeks from today, we'll have our annual meeting. And the annual meeting is really, really important for the parish. It's where we elect new vestry members. It's where we elect delegates for convention. And it's also where we, um, uh, and we have to have a quorum for that. Um, we'll also present a budget uh, so that you all can see what we're going to be using um, for the budget for the church for the next year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of important things that we do at the annual meeting. Um, it's part of our governance structure. So if you can possibly be here two weeks from today for the annual meeting, that would be great. Um, final two announcements. Uh, number one, I've already told a couple people this, but if we want to encourage people to migrate and take their homes from Tulsa and move them to Muskogee, today and today only, we can tell them that it is twice as warm in Muskogee as it is in Tulsa. <laughs> it was two degrees in Tulsa and it is four degrees in Muskogee. It is balmy here. They need to relocate. <laughs> um, yeah, I had another. Oh, the other cold-related joke. Uh, so um, there's a uh, there's a Facebook page where the bishop makes announcements to clergy, and so uh, so it, they've got that sucker locked down. But um, there was lots of debate on you know, are we going to have services this Sunday? Are we not going to have services this Sunday? Et cetera, et cetera. Everybody was voting for services, but there were also lots of jokes about how, like you know, I've heard people describe us as the frozen chosen. You've heard that right? I think it's a little unfair. I don't think we're really the frozen chosen, but today the term might actually apply, right? So that was the second joke. Um, okay, so any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Any birthdays or anniversaries? Okay. That sweater looks warm. Yes. Okay, so we're going to pray for Jean and anyone else who may be having a birthday or an anniversary this week. 
O God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And happy birthday. Thank you. Absolutely. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be he with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, 
in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. May God, who sent the Holy Spirit to rest upon the only begotten at his baptism in the Jordan River, pour out that spirit on you who have come to the waters of new birth. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. to love and serve the Lord.